What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, Scott Lane, the Black Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. the real Adam Coleman. So, you ride with True ID. Uh, check it out, man. So, I've been doing this show for a little bit over a year now, I think. I th- yeah, I think that's right. And uh, one of the biggest regrets that I have, you know, from you know doing the show um, from, from the time that I started till now is... <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing when I first started, y'all. I really did. You know, as far as recording is concerned, you know, uh, I did gospel rap back in the day. And so I had some equipment, you know, that I pretty much just repurposed to, you know, record the show with. And I just worked with what I had, man. I, mean, I knew some basic stuff as far as recording. But uh, that being said, some of my earlier guests, you know, I recorded and, you know, the sound didn't quite come out the way that it, that I would hope it would. And I didn't really know how to repair it. But fortunately, you know, as I've kind of learned over the last several months, I've learned things about the recording game a little bit. And I've been able to go back and uh, make the edits needed to some of the earlier uh, people that I um, that I interviewed, you know, so that, you know, it, the sound would be clear and all that kind of stuff. And so that's the case, you know, with this episode here, I'm actually pulling this one out of the archives, man, digging into crates, you know, going back to one of the first guests I actually interviewed, you know, grind. I'm kind of like on my uh my man, who, what my man, uh, Primo, you know what I'm saying? He used to have all like, the dope samples and all that kind of stuff, digging into crates. But anyway, uh, definitely wanted, wanted y'all to check out this episode. Uh, I had a I had a blast uh, when I interviewed this guy, man. At one point, I actually forgot that I was even recording. So I'm glad y'all to finally get a chance to enjoy it, man. And um, yeah, man, you know how we do. Try D. Let's go. <laughs> Trying to find my way, 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 trying to find my way. Trying change me. My faith is in God alone, beyond a reasonable doubt. This brainstorm yeah. pouring rain on your season of drought. Yeah. Just trying to lay a couple seeds in the mouth. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Oh. You ever get the feeling you was missing? What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, Scott Lane, the Black Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. the real Adam Coleman. So, you riding with True ID. Man, I'm telling you, in the black community, you know, there's this infectious sentiment that Christianity is the white man's religion. Well, it's high time that the church exposed the truth on uh, that modern myth. So, on that note, here on True ID, you know, we're going to do what we can do. You know, so with that said, we welcome to the show Dr. Vince Bantu. How you doing there, brother? Hey, hey, how's it going, brother? Doing good, man. Happy to be here on True ID. Absolutely, man. We're glad to have you. You know, we've been talking about this for a while, you know, through emails back and forth. And it's good to finally have you on the show. Um, I tell you what, before we go any further, you know, I was doing some research on, you know, in preparation for the show. And here's what I need to know is this. Can I borrow <laughs> one of your degrees? Because I'm telling you, you got, <laughs> you got so many of them. You know, you got so many of them. I'm like, man, this we're dealing with a true scholar here, man. I just need to borrow one time. I can put it up on my wall, maybe airbrush my name into it, you know, just so I can feel smart for a day, man. If I could just borrow <laughs> one, that'd be great. Man, it's funny because, like, it's funny because my homie, Will, uh, growing up, when I first, like, felt called by God to go into academia, and, you know, I was going with it, and I, like, just kept going with these degrees, man. It was around the middle of that, like, between college and seminary that, you know, Kanye West dropped his first album, College Dropout, uh-huh. and he had that little skit on there where he was talking about, you know, well, when I die, you know what I'll have? That's right, those degrees. And all the rest of these homeless people got regular newspaper, but I got these degrees, you know. Right. And so my homie was, he'd be, he'd be, he'd be making fun of me, saying, like, that's going to be you, Vince. You're going to have all them degrees. Hey, well, you, you proved them right, bro, because you've been, you've been on the grind, man. You, you got, like, the whole alphabet behind your name. <laughs> that's crazy that's oh, crazy man, well, i'll all... tell you what you know if you could with our just kind of let our audience know who you are you know what you've been up to and that sort of thing man yeah no that'd be awesome man. yeah so um yeah well uh you know as you mentioned like uh the name is uh dr vince bonsu and um you know i'm right here uh in st louis missouri actually my hometown um so uh i kind of you know, have a couple of main things that I'm doing here uh, in town. And uh, uh, one of them is I'm uh, actually a teaching pastor uh, at my church, Jubilee Community Church, uh, which is uh, located in North St. Louis, right in the heart of the north side, mm. uh, North Grand. And we're uh, we're affiliated with the Evangelical Free Denomination, and we're 
a um a urban multi ethnic multi racial uh church plant right. and uh you know we're we're deeply rooted in the Christian Community Development Association, so we do a lot of different things of trying to just develop the community we have a c d c and uh I actually uh do different things with providing theological education for urban uh african American pastors and other minorities and uh we just you know we just do a lot of different things in the community um and uh and then also I'm a professor at uh, Covenant Theological Seminary which is the National Seminary for the Presbyterian Church of America the PCA uh which is based in St. Louis and uh and so I teach missiology at uh Covenant mm-hmm. and um and I also do uh some church history and some urban ministry and things like that um but yeah that's kind of what I'm up to and I live here uh in the city in the west side with a uh, my wife, Deanna, and our two beautiful daughters, All right. uh, and actually live uh, just about maybe five blocks from where I grew up. And so I grew up here and went went away for a long time, and <laughs> like we were saying, got a bunch, came back with a bunch of degrees, and uh, now, you know, just, just really grateful that God has uh, brought me back, kind of like Nehemiah, brought me back to my, my hometown, which has really been on my heart, you know, for all those years, uh, really al- always kind of had a a goal and a mind uh, and a calling to come back and pour into my, my city and my community I love so much. Um, and then especially a couple of years ago when things were jumping off with Ferguson, uh, that was just really hard to be, uh, you know, I was out in New, New, uh, the New York City metro area at the time in New Jersey, hmm. uh, and that was just really hard to see from, from a distance. And so it's just, really, it's just really a blessing to be back here in my hometown, back in my old neighborhood, and uh, just, you know, trying to do what I could do to be a part of what God is doing uh, in our city. Man, that's excellent. That's excellent, man. Um, you know, interesting. I'm, I, I kind of need to jump ahead of my what I was gonna ask you because you said something about um, educating pastors. I think you said like in the urban context or something like that. And I, and I read something about that in your bio. And um, if I could just ask you, um, you wrote a piece about uh, how in the early church, education was was something that was like highly esteemed. You know, I think that kind of sums up. You know, I was reading I was reading something that you wrote about that. And um, kind of is, does that kind of factor into is that is that the um, I guess kind of the, the fuel behind why you do you know education in the urban areas? Is that, is, do you kind of tie that in there? Yeah, man, definitely. That's like uh, I mean, really, man. At the end of the day, that's kind of like my ultimate passion. I mean, my ultimate calling. Like, I mean, obviously, all of us are here ultimately to give glory to God. Um, you know, but we all have our specific ways that He equips us to do that. Uh, and also, you know, especially when you get into the area of racial reconciliation and social justice, mm. there's all these different needs. There's all these different facets of it. I mean, like I said, our church is deeply involved with CCDA, the Christian Community Development Association. And, you know, and that's one of many kind of networks or gathering places for believers who are passionate about bringing the gospel to bear on not only the spiritual, but also the physical uh, salvific implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the gospel doesn't only speak to our need for spiritual salvation, but also for uh, racial emancipation and uh, for economic equality, and, and it speaks to all these different issues. And, you know, when you get into that, there's all there's so many complex issues, immigration, mm-hmm. uh, you know, prison, uh, mass industrial complex, and, uh, edu- you know, just uh, health care, immigration, and there's just so many different uh, justice issues that, I mean, they're just so complex in and of themselves. And really, man, the one that, while it might not even necessarily be as pressing, uh, on people's minds, uh, theological education mm. is really the justice issue that I really feel called to. So, man, I'm not even really uh, necessarily an academic uh, in the strictest sense. I'm, I've never really felt called to, like, in a university setting or kind of uh, just being a researcher, but um, I really felt called to this when I went to seminary, and I was at uh, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Boston, and they have an urban campus in the city in the Roxbury neighborhood that's actually... Uh, you know, right around the corner from where Malcolm X grew up, uh, and, mm. and his, his house that actually he grew up in. And the whole focus of it was equipping urban pastors of color with theological education. Cause I, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in St. Louis. I grew up in the, in the city context and I'd always wanted to study and learn more about theology. I had a heart for God at a young age. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd be sharing the gospel, but I wanted to learn more. I had this hunger to learn and study the scriptures and study theology. But, I didn't have any outlet or any opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, God opened up the door for me to go to a Christian college. That's where I met my wife. And it was a great experience. But I think even during that time, I was really uh, sensitized to the reality of how theological education, especially at higher levels, is not 
uh, as accessible to everybody in terms of race and socioeconomic background. Mm. And I was really sensitized to that. And when I went to seminary at Gordon Conwell and saw the way that this seminary was was really putting their money where their mouth was and to try to uh, that, and I was really, and I was a part of, during my own, I was a part of a seminary context where, uh, you know, I was, I was, it was, it was like 85% of students of color. Mm-hmm. Most of them were storefront pastors, bivocational. Most, of, a lot of them were not even from the United States. And being able to see, uh, you know, the, the globe, because, I mean, we know that the church is a global, uh, it's a global church, that sure, sure. it's not a white man's religion, that it's not, the, that actually statistics show that the church is declining uh, among the majority culture in North America and in Europe, which is the Western world people have always associated to be the Christian world. Mm-hmm. But in actuality, the majority of Christians are in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and Asia. Um, but the rea- but the unfortunate reality is that despite the global nature of the church, that the seminaries and the Christian colleges don't reflect that reality, mm-hmm. and those still only exist in predominantly in the white world. And so, uh, to, when I was able to be a part of you know seeing education being brought to and starting to actually reflect the actual church and seeing the power that can happen when believers and leaders of color who are passionate for the gospel. And, and long to be able to study and long to be able to equip their passion and in their anointing that they already have. It's not like education gives you anointing. It's not like it's a requirement. Mm-hmm. But we have a lot of people who are hungry for the Word and are pastoring and laboring for the Gospel that would love to be able to study systematic theology and love to be able to study Greek and Hebrew sure. and, and, and biblical studies. But because of the way in which it's economically and culturally uh, often so unfeasible, it doesn't happen, and we've been historically kept out of these institutions. Goodness gracious. And so to be able to see uh, that happen and be made available, to me, it is a justice issue, and it's one that that was the moment, kind of the altar moment, where God showed me that was what he had for me uh, to do with my life and to really push me forward, and that's what, that's what inspired me to go, and I was like, I need to go, and I need to get a PhD, and I want to be a part of that kind of education. And so, um, you know, I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm just a, a, about a year out of my finishing my PhD, and and uh, one I mentioned, you know, one of the ways I'm trying to work with bringing that kind of um, that opportunity here to my city is actually in partnership with Gordon Conwell Seminary, where they have a, a satellite campus set up where you can actually get uh, a master's of religion mm. uh, in in small cohorts where in your city. And so we're right now our church is uh, laboring to make wow. connections. And with other pastors, and we have several pastors, uh, you know, our senior pastor of our church and several leaders in our church and other churches in the area are signing up, getting ready to get their masters also through Gordon Conwell, one of the top evangelical seminaries in the country, but at a affordable price uh, and in a culturally accessible curriculum. And so that's really one of the kind of the things I'm working on here that I'm really excited about. <laughs> man, I'm telling you, man, <laughs> this is wild, man. Like, I knew... Let me tell you something. You know, when I sent you, you know, I sent you a list of questions, you know, to kind of pre- prepare for the show. And I knew as I was kind of studying up on you, you know, reading up on your background, that you were going to hit me with something that's going to make me want to throw away my whole list of questions and go a different direction. I mean, you just say like, like 10 different things I really can harp on, man. Goodness gracious. Wow. Um, I, I, I got it. All right. Look, I, I promise you I'm, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with uh you know the the plan here, but I, I gotta ask you one more question. You said something that I think is deep, and I never thought of it this way. You said that theological education is a justice issue. Like, can you? Like, I'm I'm trying to wrap my mind around that. Like, can you can you help me understand that? You know, from your perspective, like, in what way is theological education a justice issue? Exactly. I mean, I, that's a great question. You know, and and like I said, it doesn't. You know, it might not. Uh, it might not come to our mind when we think about, uh, especially in comparison to some of the more immediate issues, uh, you know, like education in, in more in primary context, or and just the reform that we need in our public schools, especially servicing uh, lower income or uh, communities of color. And then we think of immigration and the way that families are being stripped apart from each other. Um, and we think about, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, just issues of, you know, policing, and 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 uh, incarceration issues and all these kind of things that um, and and you know and while I would say that uh, you know for many of us some of those issues are much more of a of a felt and a more immediate need mm-hmm. um, that and in you know in some ways people might consider theological education a luxury anyway um, but at the same time uh, this is something that that 
uh, it really touches my ho- my heart, and and I don't see it as more important, but it's just one of several other issues that we sometimes may even, uh, get to and address. As I was saying, the, the reality that despite how diverse and how globally diverse the, uh, the church is, the seminaries and the Christian colleges don't reflect that diversity. Look at you know just if we were to put if we were to do a demographic study of you know, of all of one billion Christians in the world and how diversely spread out we are geographically. But then if we were to look at the majority of the seminaries and Christian colleges and opportunities for advanced theological education, oftentimes those 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 two demographics would look drastically different. Mm-hmm. And and, and right. to the point to where even among many communities of color we have been bamboozled and we have been ideologically oppressed to the point of viewing theological education as a white thing mm. and as something that is and we even sometimes will embrace anti-intellectualism mm. and we will couch it in in pneumatological terms of saying well that's contrary to the spirit uh, but we know that god is a god of order and that also god calls us to study to show our and then also we know from church history that even some of the earliest examples of seminaries in church history were in Africa and were in the Middle East. Come you had on, the yeah. Catechetical School of Alexandria, yes, sir. and you also had the Theological School of Nisibis, which was in the Persian Empire, where mm. you know Christians, monastic communities were studying theology, biblical studies, were learning several languages, and even were studying medicine. And so theological education, the idea that that is a Western or a white thing, is, uh, while understandable in some sense, especially when you're coming from uh, an African-American perspective, and mm. we're looking at our history and the way that we have been systematically kept out of mm. theological education as it has been practiced here in this country, that we have to go back uh, even be before uh, our our uh, kind of unfortunate entrance into this continent through the Middle Passage began to where theological education was being practiced by Christians of color long before the gospel ever even reached Europe. Goodness gracious, man! Look, I'm you know I'm about to do something that I, I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've done this with the interview. I'm gonna just stop and ask my audience to play back the last five minutes of what this brother just said, because there's a lot of jewels that just got dropped in there, and I've studied just enough to to know that you like you really hit us with some meat. I'm gonna have to play it back myself. Cause you really said a lot right there in that little bit. Well, I tell you what, I'm, I'm gonna be disciplined. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to the questions that we had uh had prepared. <laughs> But just just understand that you have officially invited yourself back to the True ID show because there's a lot of what you said. <laughs> that, that I I got to get you back on, man, to cover some of the, some of that stuff, man, without question. So consider yourself, uh, you know, you'll be coming back for a part two at some point. Um, hey, amen, man. I'd love to. <laughs> man, that's awesome. Okay, so so you've talked about the urban context, uh, you know, urban ministry rather. Um, what what kind of got you interested? And maybe that's kind of an overly simple question, but what kind of really sparked that in you? When did that become a passion? What, what got you moving in that direction, urban ministry? Yeah, man, like, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a, um, uh, kind of have wear multiple hats, you know, because I'm a pastor and professor, and, and uh, you know, I never, you know, I, I actually, you know, came into education out of a desire to serve in ministry. and They, they really overlap for me. Uh, again, like, that's the way that I, really want to be serving in ministry. Uh, you know, I'm a teaching pastor here at my church. But, um, but yeah, man, I just, uh, I felt called to, called by the Lord to ministry at a very early age. You know, I was uh, I was saved at an early age, and I grew up here in St. Louis uh, in the public school, and I'd be witnessing to my fellow classmates and mm-hmm. handing out tracts, and start, and I had a, I was leading a Bible study in my high school, and mm. I just, uh, I literally actually uh, audibly heard the voice of the Lord call me to ministry one night I was coming home, I was 16 years old, getting on work, working at the local grocery store here in the neighborhood, and uh, and I literally heard the voice of the Lord call me and tell me that, that ministry was the path that He had chosen for me, and, and pastoring people and sharing the gospel mm-hmm. and helping people, helping teach people and interpret the Word and share with them God's heart and desire for people in their lives. And so that was just something that I knew at an early age, man, and I was, you know, doing that. Um, and then, it, you know, and then... But, the, the, the two callings really overlap, both the pastoral and the academic, sure. because when I received that call, it immediately turned into a desire to learn. I, and I never even really stopped to think about it, and really uh, later on, you know, kind of when I was in seminary, is when the when the light bulb kind of clicked. But at first, at that time, when I was 16, as soon as I felt that assurance that the Lord was calling me into pastoral ministry, that automatically clicked 
in my mind to a desire to want to learn more. And I, I remember, man, being uh, growing up in a small kind of you know a working class church, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, no, you know, again, no, nobody was really able to or had the opportunity to get that kind of theological education. So I can even remember, you know, being hungry, man, and reading my Bible, um, and I'd be, you know, in, in the Word. And then I would have a question. I would go even try to go to someone, like go to my mom, or I would try to go to someone in the church and ask them, and nobody would have the answer. Mm-hmm. And I would be reading like a footnote in my, I read, I read a verse, and then it would have a footnote saying, "Well, the Septuagint says this," and I couldn't even pronounce what the Septuagint was, uh. let alone knew what it was. And so I'd be going to ask someone, and they'd be like, "Well, I don't know what that means." And you know, uh, and, and so it's just things like that to where I would, I would want to, I would want to learn more about biblical and theological studies, but I didn't know how to do it, and I would go to college fairs. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I was, I was walking around as a 17 year old, you know, junior high school and then senior high school getting ready to go to college. And I'd be asking, you know, but again, the college fairs that came to my urban uh, public school were not any, you know, uh, again, top liberal arts colleges, certainly any Christian colleges that had, you know, good, you know, theology programs. And so I go to a college fair and it would be all, it would be only like, you know, tech schools or trade schools or community colleges, mm. or at best, our local kind of city uh, university here, which doesn't... So I'd be going around these tables saying, do you have a program in theology? Do you have a program in theology? I want to study theology. And they'd just wow. like, nah, we got welding, you know, and we got, you know, uh, engineering, and so, you know, mechanical engineers, stuff like that. And again, I'm not dissing none of that. I'm not, sure, you know, sure. if that's what God has told someone to do, then, you know, praise God. But it's oh, more man. of the fact of why was why are things like theological education unavailable to certain communities, and why does it make, why is it so difficult to do it? Um, I but, you know, that, yeah. again, man, that's, that's, you know, I, I went, you know, went through it. Um, and, you know, again, it was really, I, I went to college and, you know, I went to Wheaton College and it was a very kind of affluent community. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and honestly, man, when I went, I was, I was kind of on some other stuff. Like I was like most people, especially in St. Louis, like it's very common in St. Louis among black folks to be like, man, I want to get out of here. Like I got to go, like I got to sure. do something. I got a homie I grew up with. He just moved to Milwaukee. And then he just came back because he's like, oh, well, you know, it's not the grass ain't necessarily greener, you know, but, right. but it's, that's just how people think. And it's not even so much, I would, I would argue, it's not even so much that there's something wrong with St. Louis, but there's something wrong with our experience here, that our experience is being made to be so difficult. And we just think if we could just get out of here, then things would be better. But, um, but that, I was on that same tip. So when I went to college, I was like, man, I'm so glad. And I'm so glad to be with all these, you know, these, these rich white folks. And, you know, mm-hmm. I was kind of dealing with a lot of self-hatred, you know. I was like, man, I don't want to go back. I'm, I want to be here. I'm tired of hearing gunshots. I'm tired of dealing with, you know, this and that. And so it was actually at that place that God showed up and showed me that he was calling me back to my community. And specifically, like Nehemiah, I brought you out to Babylon and given you a certain, you know, like Nehemiah was the cupbearer of the king and gave you mm-hmm. certain status and certain opportunities so you can go back and you can empower your community so that, you know, other people don't, it, it could be a little bit easier for the people you grew up with and your family and your community. And so I'm, I have given this to you, you know, it's like what God told um, the nation of Israel and, and, and Isaiah, he said, it's too small a thing for you to simply be my people, but I'm going to be a link to the nation. It's God has given me, it's not just for me to get better myself. And I think that that is, I mean, this might be getting off on another topic, but I've mm-hmm. mentioned CCDA, I mentioned the whole dynamic of community development, but um, I think that there is a prophetic message in there for many of us as black Christians who are from the middle class or from educated class and have these opportunities, that are we using those opportunities to to uh, empower and to really partner with our brothers and sisters who are still in city, urban communities that are in poverty? And mm-hmm. are we bringing those, the, those resources to our people so that we can empower and bring them with us and not simply uh, just kind of, you know, do it for ourselves. And God really, I was on that, you know, kind of page and God really showed up and said, this is not just for you, but this is so that you, you know, you can make a transformation in your community. So that's really what, you know, kind of what did it. Wow, man. Wow. I mean, what you said was so powerful. I couldn't help but think, and I'm not going to get off on a tangent, but uh, my granddad, uh, would tell stories about um, he, apparently he knew uh, Charles Drew and Charles Drew's brother, you know, like on a personal level, you know, he used to kick it, eat lunch and that wow. kind of stuff, you know. And it's funny because I, I, I'd heard of Charles Drew, but my grandfather would refer to him as Charlie. So when he was talking about Charlie, I didn't know who he was talking about, you know. But he, you know, and so when I finally figured out that he was talking about Charles Drew, he would just, it just really illustrated that, you know, back in the day, you know, before, you know, we had other options, you know, you had the doctor. 
you know, living next to the janitor and living next to the lawyer and so forth, you know, and then once opportunities arose to where people could go to different, you know, neighborhoods and so forth, you know, we really kind of just, you know, left some folks, you know, I don't want to say behind, but, you know, you know, we took advantage of those opportunities, but we didn't bring everybody with us. You know, we didn't go back to sew back to where we came from, you know. I just think it's so mm-hmm. powerful, you know, in terms of what you're saying is that, that you know, God instructed you to sew back into, you know, you know where you're from. I think that's a powerful thing, man. That's powerful. Um, so, yeah, man. So, you know, what, you know, just kind of shifting gears a little bit, you know, and I, I, I definitely want to get your insight on this. Unfortunately, you know, like we talked about, um, you mentioned a second ago that anti-intellectualism you know, is a problem within the black church, you know, and I think in some ways, you know, coming right alongside that is this issue of Christianity being the white man's religion, you know, Mm. and Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, you know, how did this gain traction, you know, in the black community? Like, you know, you know, what are are you saying in that regard? How, How did it become such an issue? Yeah, man. I mean, that's, I think that's a great question because, it's, it's interesting the way in which I, I would say that uh, what my friend Dr. Stuchan Rock calls the Western cultural captivity of the church, mm-hmm. um, this this idea, again, this association with Christianity, with the Christian religion, with with whiteness or with uh, Western Western culture mm-hmm. or with Americanness, for example, wherever you're at, depending on, you know, kind of uh, which of those or all of those kind of associations, those cultural associations that get labeled on the Christianity. It's interesting how in the non-Western world or among minorities or people of color around the world, how consistently uh, prevalent that concept is, and yet how differently it is played out in different communities. And yet mm. so many communities arrive at the same conclusion through different historical circumstances. And yet it is different and the same at the same time. I mean, you see this sentiment on the Native American reservation, which is why that, I mean, even less than 1% of Native Americans are Christians. Uh, and then, again, there's this association that, well, that's the religion of our oppressors. That's the religion of the people who colonized and stole sure. our land and put us on the reservations. And they, yet they have a very different history, but uh, it's very similar to African Americans who, you know, uh, although we're a predominantly Christian people, you have many more people increasingly uh, going into some of these other movements. And, uh, again, a lot of times it's not even out of a, a sense of theological conviction. There's, mm-hmm. At least in my experience when I talk to people, it's not uh, it's not a, a problem with Jesus or the claims of who Jesus says he is. Mm-hmm. But again, it's oftentimes, um, you know, kind of racially motivated, the idea that Christianity is associated with the religion of the people who stole us from Africa and stripped us away from our families and, uh, and then also put us through uh, Jim Crow and segregation. And even now today, uh, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the oppression that we're going through with police and, and, uh, and just, you know, a lot of the same issues are still endorsed by a lot of people who call themselves Christians. And so I can understand why, uh, people across the world, uh, even, you know, and in, even overseas, I mean, people in the Middle East will often associate Christianity as being a Western religion. I mean, pe- Middle Eastern people will look at Britney Spears and say, that's a Christian. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, people in China, same thing. I mean, even though, uh, the gospel is, is, is growing rapidly in China, uh, right, people right. who don't want to be Christians, they will often associate with being American, that that's an American thing. And they will sometimes view, uh, their, their Christian neighbors who are Chinese who've converted to Christianity as, as sellouts to American culture. And so, again, mm-hmm. it's to the point to where the gospel has been so, uh, it's like the gift of the gospel has been so wrapped up in Western white American packaging mm-hmm. that the world can't even see Jesus anymore. They can't even see the gospel. They just see the Western white cultural packaging. I mean, it's, wow. and it's to the point where Christians in the Middle East, or you know, uh, you know, the, the, this insider movement that people talk about, or Muslim background believers will will believe in Jesus or believe in in uh, in, in Jesus as the Messiah, mm-hmm. um, but they will not call themselves Christian because again of the cultural association of that term. And so, um, and so, I mean, I could, you know, you could completely understand how the way in which the West and, uh, and different Western white powers have colonized, oppressed, mm-hmm. and, and pillaged uh, almost every corner of this earth. I mean, Malcolm was right when he said there is not one place the white man has gone where he brought peace and harmony, but that where he did not bring colonization, slavery, and destruction. And there's truth to that. And the unfortunate reality that we have to recognize is that 
that came along with proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaiming Christianity. Mm-hmm. And so it's very understandable why somebody would come away with that, that understanding on one level. Um, but that's why it's very, it, that's why it's even uh, so much more important for us to be educating people, learning ourselves, and then educating others on that is not what the beginning of Christianity was. Mm-hmm. And that was not even, uh, that was, that, that's, if you take the whole 2,000 years of Christian history, that is not, that's a, that's a small fraction of the whole church history. And we have to be able to educate people on the way in which the gospel was growing among indigenous Africans mm-hmm. and indigenous Middle Eastern people and Asians, uh, not only before Islam ever even came around, but also before the gospel really took firm root among Western and Northern Europeans. Mm-hmm. and that the gospel was actually growing among people of color from a very early age. And so, despite how understandable it might be to have this perception of Christianity as a Western white religion, it actually isn't historically accurate. Um, but, wow. again, we're looking through the last few centuries of our unfortunate history, uh, and, and we have to look beyond that. We have to look past that and see that, actually, what we have thought of Christianity, the way it's been, it really actually has a lot more to do with Western white cultural imperialism, and it actually has very little to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's not even Christianity. And we have to look past that to be able to see the true and pure gospel of Jesus Christ, which is transcultural, which is transnational, and and translinguistic, and incorporates every tribe, nation, and tongue, and Mm -hmm. has been doing that from from day one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, so... Blowing my mind here because, you know, see, the interesting thing is, is that from my standpoint, you know, um, I encounter people who, you know, hold this perception, but, you know, I don't really have a, um, you know, international view on it. You know I mean? It's kind of more so anecdotal, but from your framework, you know, you're looking at it from a broader lens and you see, it's, you know, it sounds like you're saying this is not just a a black thing, but it's kind of a a worldwide thing, you know, that we have. Oh, no, this is a global, this is a global epidemic. I mean, this, I would, I would go so far as to argue that the, the Western white cultural captivity of the church, the association of Christianity with Western white American imperialism is the number one obstacle to the proclamation of the gospel. I mean, you know, this, I've mm. thought about, you know, uh, you know, like sometimes people say, oh, well, this is, you know, we talk about all this racism stuff. It's just some liberal uh, socialist agenda or whatnot. No, no, no. The goal here is, the, and as, you know, what the goal of True Ideas, the podcast, is is trying to help us to proclaim the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, the sir. goal here is the, is, the, is the glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And that is the ultimate goal, that people come to a restored relationship, not only as individuals, but also as whole people groups, mm-hmm. as whole communities. I mean, our individual, again, that's part of American activity, is that we have this very individualistic focus on, on relationship with Christ, when actually the Bible addresses people groups. It addresses mm-hmm. nations together. Mm-hmm. God speaks to whole people groups and talks about his relationship with a whole people group. And mm-hmm. so we don't think like that, and we apply our individualistic mindset to the Scriptures. But again, this is, this is, this is one of the reasons as to why um, it's such a, a difficult obstacle to the Gospel, because we have, as we said, whether it's African Americans here, whether it be Hebrew Israelites or Five Percenters or, or, or Nation Islam or whatever it may be, or whether it's you know, people in Native American community or... Uh, or, or, or in the Middle East, or anywhere else. Like, it's all uh, the same problem, is that the way... And, and, uh, and you know what, I just realized I didn't even answer your question, because you asked where to start. Well, I would argue that this actually started in the 4th century, okay. when Constantine declared Christianity to be the religion of the Roman Empire. All right. And I would say that is where this issue started, and then it was a snowball effect from that point on. Mm-hmm. Because when you... When you uh, declare, when a people group declares that a religion is synonymous with their cultural identity, mm-hmm. then it becomes difficult to uh, for, for that religious group to enter into other cultural communities, and for other people to come into that. There's a cultural captivity that goes on there. Okay. And so, for example, in the religion of Islam, there's a degree of cultural captivity, especially when it comes to language. Now, to be sure, Islam has a very global focus, and when you go to the Kaaba, you see people of all nations and all races and tribes and everything, but there still is a level of cultural captivity to it to where there's a priority on the Arabic language. Okay. For Muslim, 
there is a priority on saying, well, if you're going to be a real Muslim, you need to learn how to speak Arabic. There's a sense in which the Arabic language is holier than any other language. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so if you're, don't, if you're not a native Arabic speaker, then you feel a sense of, well, I, I'm not quite fitting in yet until I have to learn that Arabic, right? But we know as in the Gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, and, and, you know, Lamansani, missiologist Lamansani, in his book Translating the Message, gets into this about the, the, the comparison between Islam and Christianity, whereas Islam is uh, linguistically uh, absorbing, the vision is to absorb all people groups into one common language. For Christianity, pure Christianity, as it's, as it's laid out in the Scriptures, is actually the opposite effect. It goes out at Pentecost, it goes out from the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. and it, it goes into every language. So we, we can already establish biblically that there is no such thing as a as a preferred language. Sure. That even the Bible itself is in three different languages. Mm. And so there's no holy language. But, again, the problem happened when, you know, when Catholics started to prioritize Latin, and somehow say, well, that now Latin is a holy language, and doing a similar thing with Arabic and Islam. But, mm-hmm. but you know, that is a, uh, that's a, with Islam, there's a linguistic priority at the very root of the religion. Whereas with Christianity, there, it's, the, it's the opposite effect, that, there is, that it's all nations, tribes, and sons. That is that mm. in Acts, Acts ten that God accepts men from every nation, tribe, and tongue who fear Him, and so there's no such thing as a linguistic priority. Um, and all throughout the New Testament, Paul and other writers are constantly coming at the Jews who think that they have a culture superior. They no, this is not just for the Jews; this mm-hmm. is for everybody. Mm-hmm. And so, but the problem comes is that when the Western world comes in and says that you know something like Latin, well, like, when you so missionaries go into Latin America or South America, this is and they're enforcing people to not speak their indigenous language but to speak Latin. Mm-hmm. And that's just ridiculous and silly, because Latin, the Bible was even translated into Latin for like almost four centuries, and it was already in Greek and Hebrew, and even more than that, it was in Coptic and Syriac and sure. Ethiopic and other indigenous African and Asian languages even before it came into Latin. Mm. And so it's preposterous to, you know, place any kind of, you know, linguistic or cultural superiority, but that's the reality that we've done with. And again, that, I would say that that started at Constantine, because that was when Christianity started to become perceived as the as a Roman religion. And so for even people outside of the Roman Empire, uh, it was it was perceived of as, well now Christianity it belongs to the Romans. It's a Roman thing. So I mean what happened was that and, you know, so Christianity in the earliest centuries was actually growing in every direction. So it was going into uh, what we would now call Europe, you know, and uh, you know, even Paul in the New Testament goes to Corinth and different parts of Greece and, and it, it Italy, uh, and even all the way over into Gaul and Spain, but also the gospel is growing across North Africa, and then also going down into the Nile Valley. We see the Ethiopian eunuch in, mm. in Acts chapter 8, and then uh, we see all the different nations listed at Pentecost in Acts 2, and then also the gospel is going east into the Middle East and into Asia, mm-hmm. and, and was already spreading er- from early, and as I mentioned, was already being translated into, the Bible was being translated into, uh, like, the Syriac language, which is a dialect of Aramaic, and which became... Uh, a cultural group that that took the gospel and spread all across the continent of Asia hmm. at very early stages. You took all the way into China and all the way down into India. Um, you know, all all in the first millennium of Christianity. And so, uh, and then same thing with the gospel going into Africa through Egypt and Nubia and Ethiopia. So the gospel was growing everywhere. But again, when when uh, this process of cultural captivity, I would argue, started at the fourth century, when again when Christianity becomes associated as being primarily identified with the Roman Empire, mm-hmm. and that you begin to see examples of this, this, the adverse effect of cultural captivity, that if cultural captivity means that Christianity belongs to this race or this ethnic group or this language group, then the adverse effect will be that people who don't fit that ethnic or linguistic or cultural identity mm-hmm. will feel culturally isolated from that religious, from that religion. And so... One, the most prominent example of that, even starting in the 4th century, was the Christians of the Persian Empire. Now, Christianity was growing in the Persian Empire at a very rapid pace, and you can, uh, mm-hmm. a good book for that would be uh, this book called The Church of the East, uh, written by uh, Wilhelm Baum and Dietmar Winkler. Okay. And that, that's a really good, concise history about the early, also uh, Samuel Moffat wrote a book of uh, Christianity in Asia in two volumes, and his first volume would give a lot of the good early history of Persian Christianity, but Christianity was growing among the Persian uh, Empire at a very early, at a very early stage. Um, and and the interesting thing is that in the third century, in the 
years, you know, familiar with hearing about how Christians were persecuted, and you know, we get a very Western, uh, Western-centric version of Christianity. So when we think about early church, we think all oh, all Christians were persecuted, and we think about what was happening in the Roman Empire when they were in the Colosseum and thrown to the lions and right. and all this and that. But the interesting thing is that in the Persian Empire, Christians actually were much safer and were enjoying much more uh, success, and even were having high ranks uh, in, in Persian government. Really? But again, we don't talk about that history because it's not the Western history, but Christians actually were were actually doing better in the Persian Empire than in the Roman Empire in the 3rd century. But in the 4th century, that situation flips when Constantine declares Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire, but now the Persian king now perceives Christianity as a Roman thing. Mm. And so he begins to persecute his own Persian Christian subjects. I mean, Persia was a very religiously diverse empire. You had Zoroastrians, and you had uh, Manichaeans, and Jews, and Christians, but he started to not trust the Christians because of Christianity's association with the Roman Empire, his rival empire. And wow. so you can see how some of those dynamics are are already beginning to play out with what we see today, that when when this religion called Christianity is associated with, with, an, with your oppressor, or with your, with your rival, or with a particular political or ethnic group, then it's going to, the adverse effect will be that it's not for me, that that's not what we do, that's not our religion. We don't, uh, we, and we will, and, and, and even today, African Americans, we will grasp any other ideology, even if we don't really fully understand it. I don't know how many black Muslims I have talked to that say they're Muslims, they might even have a crescent tattooed on their face, mm-hmm. and they cannot quote the Quran for nothing, <laughs> right, and they don't right, even right. know what the Hadith are, right. or they don't even know what Tafsir means, and okay. like, they don't even know their own religion, but, and, 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 and these are my people that understand where they're coming from, and they're just grasping at something to make, to give them a sense of identity, but again, mm. they, we, we cannot allow even centuries of the gospel being perverted by white supremacy, we cannot allow that to keep us from the goodness of Jesus Christ. Who, whose gospel spread in Africa before Islam even existed. And so again, we have to go past our American history, and we have to look at African church history, where a lot of the earliest African kingdoms during the early church were Christian. Sure. Not, just, not just that Christianity was prevalent in those areas, I mean, these were Christian nations. Egypt and Nubia and Ethiopia were Christian nations. Mm. In, the first, like, in the first five centuries before Islam even, even existed, and then when Islam did come uh, come about in the Arabian Peninsula, they came over and they conquered Egypt, and they tried to conquer Nubia, but Nubians were so powerful that they fought them off. That's right. And so for so many years, you had a black Christian Nubian kingdom that would not be converted or forci- forcibly converted to Islam by Arab Muslim conquerors. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, again... Uh, but again, we don't teach on that history, and a lot of black Christ- black Muslims in this country don't even know about that history. And again, is why it's just so important to really give the whole story about things. Man, you know, uh, you know, golly, you're dropping bars right now, bro. Um, so here's the thing, right? I got to ask you a difficult question, okay? Uh, mm-hmm. Based on some things you said, because you know, um, I, you know, just in kind of you know looking at your bio and reading up on you, kind of in preparation for the show. I know you've done a lot of work in terms of racial reconciliation, and I believe actually this week you're doing something, some diversity lectures. Is that correct? What was the last question? I believe like th- this week I think you're doing some uh, lectures on diversity and like racial reconciliation or, or something like that. Is that is that right? Yeah, um, yeah. Were, were you thinking of a specific one or? Well, no. I, just, I know that you've done a good amount of work. You've got a, you have a really developed uh, framework in terms of racial reconciliation through the gospel. You know, and I was kind of reading about that. Now, my question is, is um, when you start talking about uh, colonization, uh, European mm-hmm. imperialism, uh, and and kind of the these um, these sorts of things, I, I got to ask you, how do you address like you know the I'll just be up. I'll just be up front with you. Some people get defensive, you know, when you, when you start mm-hmm. using terms like that. Now I understand exactly what you're saying. You know, how do you cross the gap? You know, within the church, like if, you, if you're dealing with a, a mixed congregation like you deal with, how do you how do you get people to understand that? You know, um, when you speak on these things, it's not an issue of blame. It's not an issue of of hating white people or anything like that. You're just stating facts of history. And you're addressing the issues that are out there, you know. Like, how do you how do you navigate that? 
Mm, yeah, well, I mean, again, uh, I, I try to encourage people. And I, I, I really try to hit the note that I, I said earlier. I try to hit that really hard that, uh, as you just said, this is not about guilt tripping. This is not about uh, any kind of political or social agenda. This is about the spread of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And so if we really are concerned about, and if we really are motivated by wanting to present the gospel in, in a relevant and continuous way, we, it is our responsibility as the Church of Jesus Christ to present the gospel in relevant ways. We are his mm-hmm. ambassadors as if God were making his appeal through us. And so it is our responsibility. And if we have this issue of the, so many people, so many people around the world viewing Christianity as a Western white religion, mm-hmm. and if that is, is one of the biggest impediments to people coming to faith in Jesus Christ, then that's our fault. Because if yeah. somebody doesn't want to you know, accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior because they just don't believe Jesus is who he says he is, <laughs> that's their business. I mean, God... We that we can't do nothing about that. Mm-hmm. But if, but if, but if people are not coming to faith because of their association with Christianity, with this kind of Western white supremacist imperialist ideology, and if the church is culpable, and I mean we can read Michael Emerson and Christian Smith uh, and read Divided by Faith and look at the statistics and the ways in which the white evangelical church has been implicit and com- excuse me complicit in. The, in, in a lot of uh, racist, systemic injustices, mm. then we have to be honest about that if we're truly concerned about, about seeing people come in the right relationship with Jesus Christ. I would, I would push back and, and, uh, to people who do get defensive and say, is your concern right now avoiding your sense of guilt or, your, or, or trying to, uh, is, it, is, your, is, your, is your feelings of you know, defensiveness, is it really, I mean, when you really look at that, um, is it really kind of self-serving? Because mm-hmm. what I'm talking about isn't trying to. It, my end goal here is not to make you feel bad. See, you're you know you're taking it to that place, saying mm-hmm. that I'm trying to make you feel bad. But that's not my goal right now. The only thing you've heard me say, you know, uh, all throughout the conversation is that this is about the proclamation of the gospel. We have to be able to present the gospel to people who have been culturally disenfranchised. Right, and so. It becomes a very, I think, selfish motive, mo- um, selfishly motivated thing when people in the dominant culture turn it into a guilt tripping thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is, I think that is a very uh, kind of manipulative and just inappropriate turn that it takes in the conversation, oftentimes. And I'll just, I'll just give them examples and say, okay, like one example I'll, I'll, I use, and I and I also picked this up from Dr. Ra, was a Time Magazine article that came out a few years ago that that it talked about the top 25 evangelical leaders in America. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, first of all, it had evangelicalism, and it had a big old American flag right next to it. And it's like, okay, you don't see... I'm like, y'all don't see how we're sending messages to the rest of the world that Christianity and American identity and you know, this whole American exceptionalism identity is, is, is not uh, kind of one and the same. But uh, even apart from that, when it listed the 25 leaders, only one of them was a female, and only one of them was non-white. And so, mm-hmm. out of twenty-five leaders, who you know, this is they're they're saying this is these are the top leaders of Christianity mm-hmm. in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, that twenty-three out of twenty-five of them are white males. Then that sends a message, and that psychologically conditions people to think, "Oh, Christianity is run by white men. Mm-hmm. That's a white male institution." Mm-hmm. And when it's from a reputable, authoritative source like Time Magazine, that people look at that sends messages, and it's an irresponsible message. But again, it's one that I mean, how many times? If we if we look at I mean I'm a I'm a I'm a seminary professor. We look at seminary uh, or or Christian college curriculum and we, the way we teach our students theology. Mm-hmm. When you look at the syllabi, again, a- almost all of the books written in when you take systematic theology, when you take biblical theology, when you take whatever class you're going to take, most of the books have been written by white men. So again, that conditions people to believe that the authority on theological matters are white men, and this and that those are the people who are best equipped to interpret and minister the Word of God. We have to look at examples like that and not be defensive. It's not about us. It's not about, uh, you know, guilt tripping, but it's about being able to be responsible and looking at the signs that we have put up. You know, in the temple, in the in you know Second Temple Judaism, mm-hmm. during uh, Herod's period, they had, uh, they had signs put up for the Gentiles warning them not to come in into the inner courtyards that only Jews could come in. It would say that, uh, that they would be that they would die if they would come in there. They would be mm. under God's judgment, and that they would only be able to come come into the outer court. 
And so we have to be looking at the signs that we put up around our institutions and in our churches mm-hmm. and, and, and all of these different things that we are also putting up signs saying, if you want to come into faith with Christ, then you have to acquiesce to this, this particular cultural identity. And we and, and and I think part of the problem is the fact that, uh, especially for the dominant the dominant culture, they don't even recognize that they have a culture. So they they're putting mm-hmm. up these signs. Like again, you see something like that Time Magazine, you know, and that that is a clear sign. Uh, Christianity is is for white people. That's a clear sign saying that. But again, uh, there's often a a, a a lack of ability to acknowledge that that's what that is because they like, well I don't have a culture. I'm just normal. Mm-hmm. And again, you see how insidiously uh, oppressive that is to this this issue of white normativity. I think it's, uh, I mean, you know, a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago in America, white people were most of them were very conscious that they had a culture. And they were very proud of being white, and sure. uh, but it was in an oppressive sense of like saying we're better than everyone else. And I think that now we've gone to the opposite extreme to where we say, well, I don't see color. I'm just I'm colorblind, mm-hmm. and so I don't have a culture. I'm just normal, mm-hmm. and that is very actually. Uh, as good-hearted as it might be, that is that is the opposite extreme and equally oppressive to think that, and, and it plays itself out in church relations to where the the dominant culture way of doing worship, of doing church, of doing theology, of doing uh, ministry is seen as normative. And again, you see this in theological curriculum. You know, when you talk about mm-hmm. black theology, it's black theology, mm-hmm. or Latino theology, or Native American theology, or women theology. Mm. But when it's when it's the theology of Jonathan Edwards or Karl Barth or John Calvin or or N.T. Wright, it's not white theology. We would we would you know white folks would be like, what do you mean white theology? You can't call it white theology. Well, then why can you call James Cone and everybody black theology? Okay, why do you right. hyphenate minorities? But then when the theology coming out of the mouths of white men, it's just normal. It's normatized and it's normalized, and that's the kind of ideological oppression that we need to be able to, uh, of course, in love and in grace, remind our white brothers and sisters in Christ that. These are the ways in which you are propagating this white supremacist narrative of Christianity. And again, the goal is the gospel of Jesus Christ being manifest among every tribe, nation, and tongue. And if you are serious about that, and if that's really what you want, then you will not just dismiss and tell the whole world that they're imagining things. Like, oh, you're just imagining things. Racism is a figment of uh, of your imagination. That's from the past. You know, there's no... There's just you know, the gospel and race doesn't matter. And does, but like, okay, but well, you are saying something that contradicts what you know. You have a hundred uh, other ethnic groups that are all doing the same thing, and you want to continue to deny that. And you can do that if you want to, but I would challenge you to really question: Is your goal at that point truly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and and doing everything you can to see that it grows and that it and that it flourishes indigenously? On every tribe, nation, and so. And, and you know, and to that point, you know, I was reading one of your uh, one of your articles. You made a statement in there about um, how how God the, the diversity among mankind is like is is God's image. I, I I can't phrase it the way that you phrase it, but basically, God's image being uh, born out among man through that diversity. I, I, can you can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, how that how that looks in terms of I guess maybe how diversity yeah. itself. You know, well, yeah, definitely, and I mean because that's uh, sometimes uh, again out of a false biblical theology. Uh, you know, again, people will, especially in the dominant culture, and even sometimes minorities will will kind of endorse this this colorblind mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's really a function of kind of post civil rights uh, America and American racial politics, where we have adopted this internal belief that to ignore racial difference is the only way forward that that is the only way that we are going to uh. have a unity is by ignoring our differences. And that, that's a colorblind mentality that is, I think, dominant in dominant culture, but also even among minorities as well. And, again, uh, not only is that not helpful, because I don't care how many people say I don't see color. When, when, when a white woman walks past me on the street, I'm six foot four, black man, and she clutches her purse, like, you're seeing color right now. You know what's <laughs> so, up. Yeah. like, stop <laughs> right. it. Stop kidding yourself and saying we don't see color. God didn't intend for us to not see color. That's like saying I don't see gender. Like, well, I don't see you as a woman. I just see you as a person. It's like, well, I am a person, and I am equal to you, but and I'm in the image of God just like you, but I am a woman. And that's, that functions, and that, 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 that affects my experience of the world and your experience of me. And that's part of how God made me, and that's not to be ignored. It's to be celebrated. 
It's mm-hmm. certainly not to be used to uh, uh, social stratification and oppression, but it's also not to be ignored either. And that's, those are the two extremes we flip-flop between. And mm-hmm. neither one of them is biblical. Because people, and people, but people will try to use the scripture and say, well, uh, ethnic difference, you know, and language difference comes out of Genesis 11, where that was a context where God was cursing people for, you know, out of their pride and cursed them with different languages. Mm-hmm. But we have to go a chapter before that in Genesis 10, where we already have the table of nations, and we already see that there are ethnic and tribal differences, and that, that, not, that did not begin in Genesis 11. Uh-huh. And even in Genesis 1 and 2, we see the beautiful diversity with which God uh, created the world, and even God himself is diversity. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sure. in, in perpetual relationship with himself, and he is, you, you can't have unity without diversity. And I mean, uh, and, and so... That's that's part of the that's that's part of God's plan, and also uh, eleven is redeemed in Acts two with Pentecost. Just as all the nations of the earth are gathered together in Genesis eleven out of their human arrogance and pride and trying to to reach heaven, uh, and 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 because of that, God curses them. In in, Gen- in Acts two, once again, the nations of the world are gathered underneath God, but now instead of them trying to reach God out of their pride, I, they are receiving God coming down to them. And God empowers them and speaks through every language. And he says, how is it that we are hearing each of us in his own language? And mm-hmm. so God embraces the When the Holy Spirit comes, he comes in a multi-ethnic, multinational, multilingual, multiracial context mm. that we still see and we're pointed towards in the future in Revelation 7-9, where yet again, all nations, all tribes, all tongues are gathered before the throne of the Lamb, worshiping him, and, our, and when John saw that celestial vision of the heavenly multitude, he didn't see a transparent, colorblind, uh, you know, like kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of group of people where everyone mm-hmm. was the same, mm-hmm. but he saw people in their ethnic and linguistic and racial difference. Yeah. And so we see right there that that has been a part of God's plan from the get-go, and to deny it, or to deny that it matters, or to, uh, and to not celebrate the differences that we have, and to cherish you know, our, you know, black is beautiful. The Bible even says that literally. In Song mm-hmm. of Songs, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, I am yeah. black and beautiful. That's, that's and so we, you know, it, it, right. and that's white right. is beautiful, and uh-huh. Asian is beautiful, and uh-huh. everything is beautiful. We have to, these are all things that are made in God's image, and only by coming together and reconciling do we truly experience the fullness of God's presence. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Man, you're killing the game right now, bro. Um, so, so here's the thing, man. I, I got a couple more questions for you. Um, I, I just want to say this. First of all, I appreciate you know what you were saying about you know imagery and the signs and whatnot because uh, you 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 stated some things that I've been trying to share uh, for a while, and some people are going to get mad at me. But you know my perspective, and I, th- I think you know where I'm probably going to go with this. But when it comes to that daggone picture of white Jesus, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, man. It's time to let him go. It's time to let him go, you know. And, and mm-hmm. my thing is, I don't believe. And, 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 and matter of fact, if you, man, I, I'm just kind of been thinking about this recently. Maybe you can kind of give me some feedback. I don't believe that you want to necessarily have like this dogmatic "don't do this" or "don't do that" when it comes to people uh, how they express their adoration for God or what have you. However, in light of the fact that race and culture and ethnicity is such a, a, a barrier for people, I think if we prioritize the gospel above uh, our artistic expression then I think we need to just, you know, for the sake of the gospel, we need to let white Jesus go. He got to go. And, and for that matter, mm-hmm. I mean, and, you know, any pictures where ethnicity is, is, is the centerpiece, you know, anything that could ethnically be a barrier, you know, to somebody else, I think we got to let it go. We got to let it go. Mm-hmm. You know, what are your thoughts yeah. on that? I mean. No, I, th- I think, I think you're right, man. I think that, um, you know, I think that I think we have to let him go, or at very least, we have to put him on hold for a long time. Sure. Because, you know, when something has been overemphasized for so long, uh, and then and then when Black Jesus or Asian Jesus or Native mm-hmm. American Jesus has been um, has been underemphasized. I mean, that white that white supremacy thing is so powerful, man. I was talking to a, a Catholic sister of mine who's with a particular order, mm-hmm. and she actually specializes in creating here in St. Louis. Specializes in creating uh, icons of of biblical figures and also church history figures, but she really is intentional about displaying kind of uh, a Near Eastern uh, ethnic hue to the to the characters. Mm. And she actually straight up was was turned down for one of her depictions of Jesus because the church, the predominantly white Catholic church, said that he was too dark, really? and so they did not want that in their church. And so 
this, this this white supremacy thing is a spirit. It is a, it, more than anything. We, again, we don't do battle with flesh and blood. It is a spiritual dynamic, and our white brothers and sisters in Christ, too many of them have been uh, have allowed that spirit to come in and rule and reign in the church, and and it needs to be named and it needs to be rejected in Jesus' name. And and so that and I think that will have to include in many places. Not only, I mean, I think I think I think the the idea of the of the white Jesus got to go. I think that that is just a microcosm of mm-hmm. of a whole totality of ways in which our white brothers and sisters in Christ they are going to need to learn. They are going to need to take a back seat for a while. Not just in terms of the depictions of Jesus, but also in terms of leadership of denominations, of leadership in uh, in Christian uh, nonprofits and organizations, uh, seminaries, Bible college, Christian colleges. We are really going to need to uh, start to uh, you know really. They're going to need to learn how to sit down and learn, and that's what I'm encouraging uh, a lot of my you know students at Dominant Culture to do is to. I mean, again, I, it's, and I, I'm a pastor in the, in, in the inner city in St. Louis, and mm-hmm. I see so many white people come into the city saying, "I want to make a difference. I want to serve in the community," and yet they all they they so often come in as a leader. They come mm-hmm. in from the perspective of a leader, from the person in charge, and they. Uh, and I mean, I seriously, I, I cannot tell you how many uh, white Christians I've met who serve in inner city communities, and their only interaction with with black people in the community is is with children, and mm-hmm. is as the as from the perspective of a teacher, from a leader, okay. and so it is still actually psychologically reinforcing their pre- their their conceptions that black people need them to teach them, they need to be leading black people, that we are in need of your teaching. But yet, I will so often not see these people who say they were hard for the city be mentored by a black pastor or a black leader mm-hmm. to actually build friendships and go to a black church. But they sometimes will come in and create colonies in the city where they group among themselves and don't actually interact with. And it's like they're just taking up space. They might as well not even be here. But again, it's only the only interaction is with uh, interacting with black people from the perspective of an authority. And so wow. uh, I think there really needs to be a push on, on so many it's visual representation, or whether it's leadership, or you know, theology. I'm very intentional with my students about diversifying my curriculum, making sure that they are they're reading uh, they're reading uh, African American authors, Latino, Native American, female authors. I want them to be reading everything, mm-hmm. and I, I I and it's hard. I mean, because it, it, when I teach a class on missions, when I teach a class on church history, when I teach a class on urban, even urban ministry, that's the thing that drives me crazy. <laughs> urban ministry is like, that's, that's got black people written all over it. And yet, you can find more white male authors in that field than you can black. And it's like, this is just ironic. It's like tragically ironic. And right. so, but I have literally, I have not, I am not kidding. I have literally spent hours scouring for an author of color in a particular, like even right now, I'm, you know, I'm teaching uh, uh, sociology of religion, and 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 even mm-hmm. that field is again dominated by. And this is a secular field. I mean, you know, this is, you know, this is. Uh, but a lot of the, especially the original authorship in that field, is so heavily dominated with white. And I've literally spent hours. I said, I am not about to put out this syllabus until I have a good representation of my required reading list sure. that I feel comfortable with. That we had, and I said, it took me hours. If I would have just said, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to put a list of books that were, you know that are considered, you know, authoritative in the field, mm-hmm. and they happen to all be written by white men, I would have been done in, in, like, 30 minutes, and I wouldn't have lost hours of my life. But mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? That was hours of my life that was worth it, because my students need to be led. And whoever, like, when I put up someone that says it's required reading in a field, I'm making a statement about their level of authority. And right. when I when I only put white men, I'm making another statement saying that only white men are authoritative. And so sometimes we have to go to great lengths, and sometimes we have to, you know, do things like that, but I think that in all, in so many ways, we really need to, and I mean, just to give you one more example, and it's also mm-hmm. kind of a plug, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, me and some pastors, uh, me and some pastors, um, friends of mine in St. Louis, we've kind of come together, we've created this network of minority pastors, and we're actually putting on a conference that's going to be on October 8th, and I mentioned Sun Chan Ra from North Park Seminary, he's actually coming down, he's going to be the keynote speaker, but there's uh, the, it's called the Inter-Minority Dialogue, mm-hmm. and actually the confer- the idea for the conference um, came out of conversation between me and some pastor friends of mine who were, were putting this together, who are uh, Asian American, Latino, African American, and we were just, we were actually at another conference where, um, about racial reconciliation, and like so many of these conversations often do, 
we were talking about how we felt like the conversation really kind of uh, devolved into a conversation about white people, like what white people need to, what they don't understand, what they, you know, what, what, you know, again, like things mm-hmm. like, you know, how, the white guilt and all these kinds of things. I'm like, you know, so much of the conversation, even if it's good, so much of our conversation, even in reconciliation, often centers around white people. Mm-hmm. And, and that is, you know, I, not, although not intention to be, it, it, it is actually kind of subversively endorsing a white supremacist narrative of Christianity, that when we make our conversation always revolve around the dominant culture. And so we said, you know what, and, and we said, and you know, there's so many other issues. I mean, Asian Americans are always feeling like left out of the conversation, like it's always black, white, Latinos, Native Americans. And also, we, we, you know, there are opportunities for, for uh, collaboration and, and working together with each other that we don't sometimes even talk about. Mm-hmm. We're so disparate and kept apart by the dominant culture. So we're putting on this conference on October 8th here in St. Louis, okay. um, and, uh, and it's gonna, the focus is going to be on uh, Native American, African American, African, Latino, Asian, like issues, both internally and how we relate to each other. And it's going to be focused on how can minorities work on our issues? What are issues that we need to be improving and how can we better partner with one another? Mm-hmm. Because again, the, you know, I, I, that's not something that a conversation that I see happening very much, but I'm just, I'm so excited for this event coming up and, and wow, just, man. but again, we have to do, and you know, I've even had some pushback, like, you know, why is it exclusively my, you know, we've, we've had to do intentional things. Like we even had a conversation with like, uh, do we want to have white speakers or do we want to have white, even with the worship leaders mm-hmm. and things like that? And we said, no, not, not this time. Not, not, I mean, I, you know, I'm in a multi-ethnic church, but I have, you know, I work with a white pastor. I have, you know, white worship leaders. I have white people. We have black, I mean, we're a predominantly black church, mm-hmm. but there's white people are welcomed into every level of our church and we work together. Absolutely. But I was, you know, we, we decided, you know what, just for this one day, just this one time, we're going to be the ones leading. We're going to be the ones teaching. We're going to be the ones, you know, up front in every way. White people can come. And, you know, I've even had people ask with an attitude, like, well, are white people even welcome to this? You know, and I'm, and I'm mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I want to, like, be say something else. But, but I just feel like, <laughs> you know, yes, of course, you're welcome. There's nothing in the literature that says you're not welcome. Right. Uh, again, the focus of conversation is just how minorities can, can relate to each other better. But anybody can come, but we internally have had to make that decision and say we really want this to be really led and pushed by people of color. And we just have to find different intentional ways to do that. And I think that uh, severely kind of reducing uh, and putting to the side these these Scandinavian depictions of Jesus, uh, you know, and really promoting uh, more Afrocentric and Asiatic and and, um, Middle Eastern depictions of Jesus, uh, again, as another way of psychologically reinforcing in people's minds that that uh, Jesus was a man of color, mm-hmm. and that and that uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all people. That I think that we definitely that it, it's not not only uh, should we, but we must engage in intentional expressions of indigenous Christianity like that. The key word right there, man, is, is intentional, man. And I, I, everything you said was powerful. I, I, I gotta throw. I got to throw this idea at you because, you know, my, my brain was really turning as you were speaking. Like, I, to my eyes, I, I forgot that we was even recording this. <laughs> I forgot I was doing an interview. <laughs> I was just sitting here listening, you know. Um, but as you were talking, I just kind of want to throw this idea at you, get your feedback, and, and then, um, then kind of wrap it up with a, with a two-part question. Um, but there's a scripture that came to me, and I, I know I'm going to mess it up. Um, but well, let me preface it by saying this, is that imperialism – is is um, has been a part of, of human history from from Jump Street since the beginning. You know, uh, mm-hmm. Europeans have had their time. You know, all different cultures have tried to oppress other people or taken over land over here. You know, it, you know, this that conquest. You know, that's part of, of human history. And I think it's an aspect mm-hmm. that we see uh, just just part of the fall of man. You know, it's it's a reflection of the fall of man. And and where I'm going with that is Jesus said that among the the among the world, in the world, they exercise authority over each other in this such a way. You know, they lord over one another. But among you, my disciples, it shall not be so. You know, mm. and he spoke directly against that sort of, um, that kind of, uh, I guess, in a sense, lack of a better way to put it, imperialism. So where I'm going with it is, even though uh, in our current context, uh, based upon history and wars and, and colonialism, you know, the European culture has that um, that dominant hold in in our society and our cultures and really around the world in the church. It should not be so. Right. Mm. You know, in the church, yeah. you know, we need to have it, it should reflect God's kingdom. 
rather than the socio-political war-produced uh, dynamic that we see in the mm-hmm. world. You know, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be that way amongst us. You know, I, how, you know, can you kind of give me a response on that? I'm, I've just been I'm just throwing it out there. Like, what do you think about that? Oh, most definitely, man. Again, I think that. Uh, I mean, 100% agree. And again, I just think that, um, you know, uh, again, so many of our, uh, you know, brothers, sisters, you know, in the dominant culture, and even, again, even sometimes uh, those of us uh, who are minorities, I think sometimes we can adopt a kind of passive, uh, depoliticized, um, colorblind version of the gospel, mm-hmm. uh, you know, out of, uh, and we can in- internalize that. I mean, even in, even in the 60s, Dr. King would get pushed back you know, even from black Christians and saying like, we just need to pray. We just need to, you know, you, you cause in trouble. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and we get the same thing now with, you know, uh, believers who are, uh, protesting peacefully and respectfully, but protesting for reform in policing practices. You mm-hmm. sometimes will even get pushed back, you know, from minorities. Uh, and then in, in the same way, like, uh, you know, uh, some of my brothers in Christ who are, uh, Native American theologians and leaders will say that, uh, the, even as they are again, laboring, to contextualize the gospel mm-hmm. in Native American idiom and, uh, and and cultural practice, and in that milieu, will get some of their strongest pushback from other Native American Christians who will mm-hmm. say, "No, you can't, uh, you can't dance and wear our, you know, Native uh, regalia, and you can't, uh, you know, you can't uh, do sweat lodges or smudging and things like that in Jesus' name. That's not; those things are antithetical to Christ. And when you come become a Christian, you have to just let go of all those things. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, really? But you can have Christmas trees." and Christmas wreaths, and oh. all these other symbols that have infiltrated Western cultural society that come from pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon Uh-oh. pagan culture, and we can, you know, incorporate those things in Christian, but we can't, but Native Americans can't do that. But again, it will come from their own people, and mm. we will also do that, again, we will have a, I mean, you know, as African Americans, sometimes we will express a similar kind of, you know, colorblind, depoliticized expression of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And so, again... As, as the passage you pointed out, and just all throughout the prophets and the call, the biblical call to justice, and the, and again the fact that the Bible does not, <laughs> the Bible, the the concept of colorblindness is a 20th and 21st century Western peculiarity, mm. and it is something that is completely alien to the world of Scripture, where God again, God dresses whole nations uh, at one time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, God, God in the Bible violates all of our rules of political correctness and our especially our our colorblind <laughs> rules like you know god god holds genera- god holds nations accountable for the sins of their generations before them yeah. but again we'll say i didn't know slaves you know and so Ooh. i mean again the bible confronts us in our individualistic culture in ways that we may not be comfortable with but again that's how the bible hits all of us because as you said uh you know all of us are for everybody is in need of the redemption of Jesus Christ and it could have been it could have went a different way it could have been that Africans enslaved Europeans could have been. and 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 you know uh kind of uh, there was an African captivity of the of the gospel yeah. and Europeans so culturally isolated and felt like well if we really you know if we really want to be down and really want to be white then we just got to worship Thor and Odin and we can't be down with Jesus you know because mm-hmm. that's our real and that's our real ancestor and you know what uh, then I would be saying the uh, exact opposite thing, I'm but it just so that. happened yeah, in, those, in the course of two thousand years. This is the way it happened. This is the way it went down. So we have to deal with where we're at. And again, to uh, to just be kind of speaking in this, you know, and recommending this kind of thing, like, well, let's just get over it. It's you know, it's like that's just not that's just not that's that's not doing what Galatians six two says, where it says carry each other's burdens, and in this mm. way you will fulfill the law of Christ. I mean, it'd be mm. like if my wife comes up to me and says, baby, we got a problem. Mm-hmm. And I say, well, uh, you got a problem. <laughs> I don't have a problem, so we don't have a problem. But, you know, I see that you have a problem. And, you know, maybe when you get over your problem, you come let me know. Uh-huh. Then we're not really, I'm not really, I'm not engaging in a marriage at that point. Well, I'm, I'm just engaging you, you know, in an individualistic standpoint. If your wife is anything like mine, then, then you'd be in some big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh man, I'm be on the couch then, boy, <laughs> right, right. and then I will have a problem. <laughs> right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they, they, you y'all would have a problem. There, there would be a we there. Well, I tell you what, man, I, I definitely want to end out uh, with some application. You know, so I want to ask you kind of this two part question, so that we can kind of, that we can kind of, you know, bring things together and give us a, you know, what can we do about this this issue? So, you know, you're dealing with somebody. Let's let's take it from a micro and from a macro um, on a macro level. Uh, first dealing with the micro, if, you, if you're dealing with a person face to face that has these concerns about 
the uh, that cultural barrier, that kind of white man's religion sort of a thing. You deal, you're having a conversation with that kind of person. Where do you go in that conversation? How do you deal with that? And yeah, again, I would just, you know, I would try to point them to literature, you know, that really kind of breaks down the the early history of Christianity in Africa and mm-hmm. the Middle East and Asia, and you know, uh, and I, you know, I mean, I'm I'm right there with it when I talk about, you know, and and affirm the atrocities uh, and and the complicity that that Western uh, white societies have played. Uh, and even the appropriation, the false appropriations of the gospel of Jesus Christ in committing mm-hmm. atrocities against people of color for cent- for centuries, mm-hmm. and you know there, there, you know, there's no argument there because I think a lot of times our people they need their they need their reality affirmed because mm-hmm. they, you know, we are the ones that are still being harassed by police. We are the ones that are still, uh, you know, being uh, being asked, you know, when we're even when we're in professional settings, what what we're doing there, and we are the mm-hmm. ones sure. that are being followed around in stores, and we are the ones. Who are being shown uh, that black skin and and our features and hair are unattractive, mm-hmm. and and I mean we're the ones that are psychologically and socially marginalized, and so that needs to be affirmed. And the church has to be the place. Again, we can't give way into any kind of or depoliticized expression of the gospel, and we have to actually get into and tap into the prophetic call from the scriptures that decries social and racial injustice, because I think that will really win over our people uh, much more to the gospel. Say, you know what, if he was alive today, he would probably be marching, and uh, he would probably be, mm-hmm. you know, marching for police reform. But that is the that is the Jesus that we serve. Mm-hmm. We, don't, we don't serve a Jesus that says, just pray and just hope things get better. But no, we, we uh, the scriptures are one that call for the people of God to do justice and to act to do righteousness and act justly and walk humbly with God, and this this is we have to re, we have to show people with our feet, not only with our mouths, but a the fullness of the gospel of Christ. And we and then uh, but then also we need to also educate people and show them that what you're experiencing now and what you're and and then uh, is not the whole uh, is not the whole story even now because as Philip Jenkins points out in the next Christendom, the tip, the typical Christian is actually probably a Nigerian woman. Mm-hmm. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ is global. Uh, but then also, if they want to get into history, they, and they say, well, but it didn't start that way, and this came through colonialism, then we have to say, well, but we have to go even back before European colonialism even existed. In fact, before Europe even existed. Mm-hmm. It, even In fact, before the concept of the West even existed, mm-hmm. that Christianity was thriving among black and brown people mm-hmm. uh, for centuries. And so we have to be able to educate them on that. I think it's some some practical suggestions. Yeah, it's so crucial, man, because um, I, honestly, I didn't even realize that Augustine, you know, Tertullian, and some of these guys were from Africa till like maybe two years ago. You know, you, you hear Augustine mm-hmm. from Hippo, right? Augustine of Hippo, mm-hmm. but you don't really, I don't, I didn't know where that was, you know? Uh, so, I mean, this, mm-hmm. is, this is relatively recent for me, too. And so, as I got, I'm going to give you this last question. Before I do that, I want to give a shout out. To my peoples up in Ohio, uh, Desmond and Dakeisha, this question is for you because they they asked me this the other day, and um, so you know, in terms of our churches, you know, and I guess as you you being a pastor, you know, and you you somewhat hit on this a little bit, but can you give maybe just two or three ideas in terms of what churches can do? We talked about kind of the white Jesus picture being up, you know, that sort of a thing, and how we can you know work around those types of things. But how you know, for some of the pastors that might be listening, what, what would be your advice be to them? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that last part. What, what was the question? Sure, you know, to some of the pastors that may be listening out there, you know, you being in the position that you're in, what are some things that they can do in their churches, you know, to address the, the issues that you've been discussing? Oh, oh, for pastors, yeah. Sure. I mean, I think that I think that the burden, uh, basically, I think like everything that we've been talking about uh, in this interview, I think that the burden of all of that falls predominantly on pastors and and leaders in Christian institutions to be leading from the top down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we cannot just expect, uh, you know, the people that we're shepherding to just figure this out or do it on their own. We have to, we have to model it. We have to exemplify it. Are we, are we preaching on things, you know, when a Ferguson happens or when, uh, when a, when a no indictment decision happens or when, when things are going to, are we, are we preaching on these things from the pulpit and, are we preaching responsibly? Mm-hmm. Are we, are, you know, are we just saying, you know, just pray and, you know, just, you know, pray and hope that things get better? Or are we saying, pray and uh, here's the information on the market? And, uh, 
here is the petition that we can sign for the alderman or for city hall. Are we actually, you know, are we praying with our mouths and with our feet? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and so we have to model that from the top down. And um, and then also we have to, it, it, same thing with people, uh, expressing contextualized expressions of worship, speaking out on issues of injustice, um, you know, building cross-cultural relationships. That's something that we have to model. I mean, I'm in a predominantly, uh, just as an example, like I'm in a predominantly uh, African-American church and in, a, in, a, in an almost entirely African-American community. Um, and so uh, I have a, a connection and a friendship with an Asian-American pastor, and we do fellowships uh, between our churches, who is a church that's on the Asian-American. Mm-hmm. And he and I are building a, a relationship and a friendship that then trickles down into our community and our members, where most of my members of my church, their only interaction with Asian Americans is when they go to the corner store, and often that interaction mm. will not be a it will either be an unpleasant one, or at best it will just be a neutral one. Mm-hmm. And so there's no positive contact for most people in the black community in St. Louis with Asian Americans. And so we are trying to change that by modeling it ourselves, the pastors, but then also by leading our congregation into that. Um, and then that will, you know, that will include, um, you know, helping each other, helping our people know. That, you know, there's some things we say and there's some things that ways that we misconstrued each other that are hurtful to one another. And we have to unlearn those bad, those habits, you know. But, but again, that's just one example. Um, we have to, whether it's, whether it's issues of justice or whether it's issues of reconciliation and crossing different lines, we leaders have to be the ones to demonstrate that to them. Not to say, hey, y'all go do it, but we have to be the ones doing it. They have, we have to be living that out because our congregations need to see it because they oftentimes mm-hmm. they don't see it. They don't know what it looks like, and we have to be the ones to show them what it looks like. Man, I love that, man. I, I love that. I mean, you're putting tangible effort. It's like it's like the word says, you know, faith without works is dead, right? You know, you put yeah. works to this thing of racial reconciliation. I love that. So you got a lot of wisdom, man. Like, you know, how can people access it? Do you have any books or products, events coming up? Like, you know, how can we, you know, uh, stay in contact with you and, and access the information that you've got out there? Yeah, man, um... You know, uh, I mean, you can always, uh, you know, definitely, um, I'm, well, you know, we got the conference that I mentioned. If anybody is in or is close enough to come to the St. Louis area, uh, we got this inter-minority dialogue happening on October 8th um, at, uh, at uh, Abundant Life Community Church, uh, Hispanic Church in South St. Louis in the Soulard neighborhood on City Street, 9 o'clock a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. Mm-hmm. On, on Saturday, October 8th, where we're going to have Sun Chan Ra, and we're going to have lots of local St. Louis pastors uh, you know, talking about these issues. I am currently working on my first book okay. where, uh, you know, I'm gonna be, uh, it's basically going to be an introduction to uh, all of these different uh, branches of Christianity early, and it's going to be basically a tool that people can uh, use to do exactly this, to, to just give a quick introduction to the early history of Christianity uh, mm-hmm. in the African and Asian world. And so uh, we definitely have that going on, but always, uh, you can always, you know, see what I'm up to uh, at... Um, you know, um, also at our church website, uh, www.jubilee-stl.org. Uh, and there's always different events and things that, that we're doing in our church community on that as well. Um, and then you can always hit me up on Facebook. I'm usually posting, uh, you know, things that I'm doing if, you know, people want to follow those things. So, so yeah, we got, we got some of those avenues. Well, man, you know, Dr. Vince Bantu, I just want to thank you again for coming on the show. You've given us a wealth of information, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, like I said, we're definitely going to have you back, you know, brother, because, uh, you know, I'm going to have to pick that brain once again. And as your book, you know, is coming along, definitely want to, you know, reconnect with you and see, you know, what uh, new insights you might have. So uh, thank you for coming on the show. And, you know, love y'all out there listening. Once again, this is True ID, another episode in the books. Peace. <laughs>